This is Jay Smith here. I want to talk about the what I consider one of the geniuses of Odin Lafontaine. You've just been watching his video, and uh, you have seen the, the amazing depth and breadth that he brings to this whole discussion on the origins. And it's been terrific looking at your comments at the bottom. You are commenting just that, and you're saying this is probably one of the best ones he's done. <clears throat> one thing about Odan, he's able to talk about almost any subject that has to do with Islam, and certainly that has to do with history. Twelve years have got him to where he is today. And he's enjoying finally talking to an English crowd. And isn't it been great to listen to his French style of English and how he pronounces word. I know a few of you have questioned that, but let him go. I think this is, listen, when we speak French, we desecrate the language. He does not desecrate English. I think it's brilliant what um, the way he usually, the, even the words he chooses. Now, in the last episode that we did, where we looked at the peoples and the many different char characters and groups that are pivotal to how Islam actually was created, we went off on a, on a side for about 11 minutes, 10 or 11 minutes, concerning the sources of the Quran. It didn't really fit in that episode, so I took it out and I want to introduce it here, showing you just the depth and breadth that Odon has. So listen to this as we really look at the Quran, because this is his area that he loves to talk about more than anything else, looking at the Quran and trying to look trying to delve and find out what happened historically, he then wanted to go back to where the Quran got its material from. It's called source criticism. And so we're just doing a, real, a little discussion, he and I, back and forth on source criticism. Here it is. See what you think, and then I'll come and end it off at the end. Those coverers were Jews who covered their sacred scriptures with other scriptures and they claim that those other scriptures were divine. And this descripts the Talmuds. In the seventh century, it was the beginning of the widespread of the Talmuds, particularly the Babylonian Talmud among the Jews. And um, some other Jews, namely the Quranic Nazarene, did not agree with the Talmud. They thought it was sort of an abomination, a sacrilege, because people invented a, a text and they put it over the Bible, over the, the, the sacred scriptures. They covered the sacred scriptures with the Talmud. And uh, they changed, because of this, they changed the meaning and of the sacred scriptures. And they hid some prophecies, they hid some stories in the sacred scriptures, and I think those stories relate to the coming of Jesus, the prophecy about the Messiah, and this is um, what the, 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 the coverers are accused of in the Quranic text by the, by the preachers. Let me just um, interject here real quickly, looking at the Quran. I'm going to read chapter 2, verse 78 and 79, while you take a drink. And it says here, it says exactly what you're saying. And there are among them, the Jews, unlettered people uh, who know not the book, but they trust of, upon false desires and they but guess. So these are people, the book, mm -hmm. the, the scriptures, they don't know the scriptures. They trust upon their own desires. They guess. Then woe to those who write the book with their own hands, and they say, this is from Allah, to purchase with it a little price. Woe to them for what mm -hmm. their hands have written, and woe to them for what they earn. So there's an exact exact example of what you're saying in the Quran. It's actually talking mm -hmm. about these coverers. It's referring to these very people. And of course, what would they have written that is not the book? That would be the Targums, the Tal, the, uh, the Mishnahs. These are the apocryphal writings that you find all the way through the Quran. <laughs> Almost all the stories. Exactly. The stories about the, uh, the, the, the certainly the different biblical prophets, the story of Abraham in Surah 21, that comes from a, a one of these coverers. That comes from the of Mishnah, of Mishnah of Rabbah, sorry, the one in chapter uh, 5, verse 31, the story of Cain and Abel. Now, there's a good example of the Targum of Jonathan Ben Uzziah. 
the very next verse, verse 32, comes from the Mishnah Sanhedrin, which was written in the 5th century. And the story in chapter 27, Solomon and the Queen of Sheba and the Hooper bird, mm -hmm. you know that story? Brilliant story, exciting story. But that story in chapter 27, verse 17 to 44, comes from the second Targum of Esther. These are all the coverers who have written with their own hands. They but guess they don't know the book, and then they're calling it the book. And that's what these covers are doing. What's fascinating is that the Quran makes the same mistakes by taking those stories and incorporating into their own text. What we find in the Talmuds, um, th there are, I think there are two, two types of um, Talmudic writings. We find ancient Jewish tradition, which might have uh, already been there at the time of Jesus, for example. And we also find um, post-Christian inventions. Yeah. And I think this ancient Jewish tradition, it, it's, like, it's like with a tree. You have the trunk, the, which is the Jewish tradition, and several branches. One branch is um, the Talmudic Juda Judaism. Another branch would be the um, Nazarene Judaism. And so this is why we can find in the Quran stories that really, really resemble the Talmud. For example, the very well-known um, uh, quote of the Quran, when uh, you kill one man, it's like you have killed the whole of the humanity. Chapter we five, also three, find two. it in the Talmud. Yeah. I, I think no one, they did not copy each other for this one, for example. It comes from ancient Jewish tradition, which, which, uh, which went one way in the Talmud and another way in the Quran, thanks to the preachers who were um, Nazarene Jews. And, and so uh, this is also to, to address many of the many comments that were made under our videos about the, the Talmud or about, about the Quran being a copy, a mere copy of the Talmud. Uh, oh, no, know, no, I'm saying, mm -hmm. Be careful, because even though what example you gave of chapter 5, verse 32, mm -hmm. which is uh, he who takes the blood of one is if he takes the blood of all. That one follows verse 31, which is the story of Cain and Abel and has been found in the Bar Sanhedrin, written in the 5th century. When in the earlier copy of the, of the original, you will find that 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 redemption analysis on the blood of Abel is actually written in the margin by a scribe, which was then mm -hmm. copied as the text to follow the story of Cain and Abel and the killing of Cain, uh, of Abel by Cain. And that, that the redemption analysis was nothing more than a scribal thinking through of the, the ramifications of the blood of Abel. Now that was in the fifth <laughs> century. So that comes long after the Bible. That's fifth century AD, not BC. So that comes just before the Quran is put together. And that's known as the Bar Sanhedrin, written in the fifth century. So these do are mm -hmm. you can play them through. We know who wrote it. We know when it was written. We know why it was written, and we even know where it was written. And it's fascinating that it's these stories that incorporate themselves into the Quran. But when you look at chapter two, verse seventy-nine that I quoted earlier, that one is fascinating because that one is shutting down this idea that, and, and it's actually it's actually warning the readers of the Quran, be careful of these very stories that are in the Quran. So when mm -hmm. and where that was put in there, it's fascinating because it's a contradiction in terms of the very thing that the Quran incorporates. It's mm -hmm. a good argument also to use when Muslims claim that we have corrupted our Bible and say, well, what about these verses? What about these stories? And exactly. where, where do you think they came from? And it's good to have this historical perspective to know. Where this is what um, Guillaume D is, is, working, uh, is working on. I've already uh, spoken uh, about him. He's a, a French scholar who teaches in, in Belgium, who is a, a very top-notch scholar on Quranic studies. And for example, he found that many of the many passages of, um, of the Quran, many stories of the Quran, are direct copies or translation from ancient Jewish tradition. For example, the um, story of the creation of uh, Adam, 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 uh, is taken from uh, um, a Jewish story from the second century, the story of Adam and Eve, and it's kind of um, uh, cut and paste into the um, in, into the Quran, and it's it's fascinating. It's really amazing to find 
the sources, <laughs> some sources of the Quran. And uh, we see a lot of Jewish sources, uh, sources from um, Jewish apocryphic or apocryphs, <laughs> um, such as, for example, the Book of Jubilees. Mm -hmm. we, we find many, many interesting stuff in the Quran and also in the standard Islamic narrative that were taken from the Jewish tradition that was also um, expressed in the Book of Jubilees. For example, the Tawaf. The fact that uh, Abraham uh, turned uh, in a circle seven times around the altar in Jerusalem. This is taken from the book of Jubilees. You do not find this in the Bible. It's in the book of Jubilees. And you find this also in the Islamic tradition. This is why the Muslims, when they perform the Hajj in Mecca, turn seven times around the Kaaba. They imitate, they, they don't know it, but they imitate the Jewish tradition of uh, Abraham, as it is written in the Book of Jubilees. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. I mean, this is terrific stuff, and maybe we should do a whole series. I uh, we did this with Paul. I don't know if you know Paul from London. He did mm -hmm. through and found he didn't know about the uh, the Book of Jubilees, but he did find the circumambulation seven times going counterclockwise. And he noticed that this is something that the Jews did. And of course, if that is the case, then almost all of their traditions have been borrowed from pre-Islamic times, looking way back to Jerusalem itself. One of the things that I want to probably one person that probably stands out in 1910, there was a book written on the sources of the Quran by St. Clair Tisdale. For those of you who want an English edition on this material, you can go to that book. It's probably it's out of print. You can get it on PDF. Just Google it. Uh, the sources of the Quran. Uh, mm -hmm by St. Clair Tisdale, T-I-S-D-A-L-L. -L. And just look at all the stories that Odon is talking about. Do you have it there? Mm -hmm. But nowadays, we, we, we keep on finding new material, uh, no, sources of uh, sources and, and more sources. That the, in France, uh, there has been a, a publication of this. Uh, it's a very, very big, uh, very big book, three volumes, the Coran des historiens, the historians Quran, in which uh, which was directed by Guillaume D and another another French scholar and um, here we have um, lots of sources in the Jewish tradition but also in the Syriac tradition in the Christian Syriac tradition many apo apo apocalyptical um, stories that we find in the Quran are in fact copies of uh, homilies from Syriac priests, such as uh, James of Sarug, or apocalyptical stories from the Syriac tradition. It's amazing. We almost have uh, a sort of um, scheme. You see, the Quran is a sort of patchwork. Pieces have been sewn together, and we can find now the origin of those pieces. <laughs> It might be good, Odon, if you and I just go through some of those sources. We don't have those in English that you have there. And it might be good for the English audience to hear these and realize the wealth of, mm -hmm. of, of research that you've done there in France. You and, and uh, Guillaume Dai, especially his works. If you could maybe introduce us to his works, because we would not know him here in the uh, United States and Europe or in the rest of the English-speaking mm -hmm. world. And we, I shall do that. we shall do this. We shall do this. Guillaume Dai. Or you can pronounce die if you want, but uh, no, French is D, D, D Y E. He has also published many articles in English. He's a, a top notch scholar, an international uh, scholar. Okay. So um, it's very easy to find his work also in, in English. Just have a look at his academia page and um, you will find lots of stuff. Okay. You've heard this discussion 10, 11 minutes, not very long. And yet it's absolutely damaging to the standard Islamic narrative. You see, the standard Islamic narrative believes wholeheartedly that the Quran is eternal, that the Quran has always existed, and could not come from the pen of any man, and certainly could not have had any antecedents to it prior to the 7th century, uh, because if that were the case, then that's an admission that the Quran is no longer eternal, no longer guarded by God, and that it can be changed and manipulated and even created by man himself. And that goes against everything that the standard Islamic narrative 
claims. It says so very clearly in chapter 85, verse 22. That's the eternality. In chapter 10, verse 15. In chapter 18, verse 27, it cannot be changed. Not by man, not by you, not by me, not by anybody. And then, of course, chapter 15, verse 9, where Allah himself guards it so it cannot be changed. Now, here, this discussion we're having, we're showing that there are all kinds of antecedents uh, those references that he has that from D, and I mispronounced it, and he corrected me on that. Guillaume D were very clear that much of the Quran has been borrowed from many different sources. If it's even one story is borrowed from another source, and you know where that source is, that introduces a whole other element, uh, which is anathema to the standard Islamic narrative, because that introduces man-made, human-made inter interaction and also interjections shuts down any notion that this could be eternal shuts down any notion uh, that this is unfettered by human hands and shuts down any notion that it even came from Muhammad in the seventh century all of these these references that we were talking about the Targum of Jonathan Ben Uzziah second century the Mishnah of Rabbah second century the Bar Sanhedrin fifth century these are all much earlier than the Quran because the Quran is supposedly 7th century, as we're now proving. It is more likely 8th, 9th, and 10th century, and maybe even later, since we don't even have the first copy that we can look at. Close to it, but not the first copy that is complete. So can you see why this is so damaging and why, though it was just set aside by Odin and myself, we weren't, we weren't really thinking through about using it. I thought it was good to do that because... This is not the only material that has been borrowed, these Jewish Apocrypha writings. There has been much more material that has been borrowed, and we'll be getting into that. This book that we've already introduced, the Sirius Aramaic reading of the Quran, these are lectionaries, and I am going to be introducing this with another researcher coming out of Germany. His name is Thomas Alexander. Thomas Alexander will be coming on board in about a week, maybe in May, two weeks. There's so many videos that I've got to go through. But he will be unpacking this book, and this is proving to be one of the most damaging books because this shows that much of the Quran, much of the Quran has been borrowed from Christian lectionary sermons. Odon has been referring to that, has he not? And then the other one that is probably as damaging or more damaging is Gunther Lulings and this book it's bright bright yellow I don't like the color but nonetheless I didn't choose it a challenge to Islam for Reformation we'll be unpacking this because this now this is his doctoral thesis he scored higher than anybody else in his university so high that he should have been given an automatic professorship which he was not because of what this has to say about the Quran lots of material yet for us to introduce on this channel can you see how exciting this is so because all we're doing is looking and unpacking and, and, and asking the very questions that the Muslims should have been asking for centuries where did this book the Quran come from where did where did they get this from where did these words come from where did they all come from Ooh, two, two, two. I've got a whole slew of them up here. I just chose the first one, and this is Kalun's, written in 835. So where did Kalun get his material from? Where did Huff's get his material from? Where did any of these get us? Where did they get their material from? Well, we're finding out. A lot of it is borrowed. Yes, pilfered out of existing texts. Arabic, for sure, to be sure. That was Arabic, because it was all written in Arabic in the 7th. And I'm saying now, it is written in the seven, not the Quran itself, but the material from which it was pilfered, the material from which it was borrowed, were written in the seven, maybe even written in the sixth and fifth, because the certainly the radiocarbon datings of the Sana'a manuscript go all the way back to 393. That's the fourth century. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. Isn't this exciting? As we unpack and pull back layer after layer after layer of the Quran, we're finding that we're getting back to the source of the Quran. And it is not pretty for Muslims. It's not pretty for Islam. And even for the Western academics who don't want you to know this. More of that later. God bless you. Just thought I'd put this up as a quick little ditty as an appendix to what we were just talking about with Odon. It's been great, great having Odon. And now we'll be moving over to Thomas soon. But come with us.
talk about what we're talking about and also come up with not only if you have difficulties not just objections but also if you find other areas that we've missed or articles that we should be reading talk about it here in the comment this is Jay over now